Praise to you, o Christ. o Christ. Please be seated. To thine own self be true. Seems like a good motto to live by, doesn't it? Living according to your principles sounds like something straight out of the Bible. Maybe the book of Proverbs. But as you probably already guessed, it actually is not in the Bible. In fact, it is a famous quote from William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Fun fact. In its original context, the phrase was actually ironic. The line was spoken by Polonius, a counselor to King Claudius in Act 1, Scene 3 of Hamlet. Now, Polonius is saying goodbye to his son Laertes, who is leaving Denmark, the country they lived in, for France. And dear old dad is trying to give him some good advice before he goes. Sound familiar to any of you dear old dads with a son or daughter going off to college? Now, the whole of Polonius' sentence is actually this. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Which means, if you're true to your own principles, you will be more trustworthy to other people. Being honest with yourself leads to being honest with others, you might say. All very good fatherly or even motherly advice. Except that dear old dad, well, he doesn't practice, practice what he preaches to his son. In the play, Polonius is actually a sneaky spy who uses his own daughter, Ophelia, to find out what Hamlet is planning. Hardly honest behavior. Good thing I majored in English in college. <laughs> but I digress. Or maybe I don't really digress because I think that hypocrisy is at the root of why to thine own self be true can, in some cases, be problematic. It can be problematic, I think, if your own personal principles are founded on, shall we say, less than honorable foundations, like self-preservation doing whatever it takes to get ahead, saving your own skin at the expense of others, like Polonius tried to do by using his daughter to spy on his enemy. Or like Queen Esther was tempted to do in our first reading. And I must say, Carol, you nailed the pronunciation of that guy's name, Haytack. I was wondering if you were going to get it right. Good job. OK, so we don't hear a lot from the book of Esther in the course of our yearly cycle of readings. Maybe that's why that name is hard to pronounce. But I think it's a pity that we don't read from Esther more because Esther has a lot to say about ethics that I think we need to hear today. Now the background of the passage is that Esther is a Jewish girl who is chosen to be one of the Persian king's concubines. She quickly ascends the ranks of the king's brides, becoming his favorite in fact, his queen in very short order. Now, the Jews of Persia had led relatively peaceful lives there until someone who hated them came into the king's inner circle. Haman, the counselor, persuades the king that the Jews are out to get him and gets him to issue a rule that all Jews are to be killed. Esther's cousin Mordecai, who is a Jewish leader, finds out about this and approaches Esther to get her to talk the king out of it. No problem, she's his favorite, right? Except that they had a law that if you approach the king unbidden, in fact, in other words, when he didn't call you, if you do that, if you dare to do that, you die. The only exception is if the king extends his royal scepter to you. In other words, forgives you for having the gall to approach him. When Mordecai asks Esther to do just that, naturally, she balks at first. Her inner principles, like most of ours, are led by the need for self-preservation, after all. But then Cousin Morty asks her a question that I think 
if any of us are posed with, that question can be life-changing. He says to her, perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. You know, I have actually a version of that quote on a clock in my office. It says, perhaps you have been born for such a time as this. I like that because it reminds me that sometimes I do have to set aside my own needs, wants, and desires for the good of other people. To thine own self be true, not if my guiding principle is self-preservation at all costs. You see, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have a personal code of ethics that we live by, not at all. I think if more people thought about what they considered right and wrong, and then lived by right values, we would have more love in the world. But unfortunately, as we all know, not everyone's personal code of ethics is so altruistic. Because just look at the world that we live in. We see famous people who use and abuse people for their own self-gratification or power grabs. We are disappointed time and again when people that we consider heroes are shown to have feet of clay. The trouble is, it is really hard to live consistently with honor. Being good is difficult. Even just living in a way that tries not to offend anybody can at times seem more than some people can manage. Which is why Jesus' death for us is so vital. Because when he went to the cross, Jesus conquered sin's hold over us. Both the big concept of sin with a capital S and also all of our petty little personal sins too. The Bible even says that he became sin for us so that when he died, so did sin's hold over us. And his resurrection gives all of us new life. I love how the reading from Romans that we just heard, puts it. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too might we walk in newness of life. You see, this is why we baptize babies, in case you've ever wondered. Baptism is the symbolic death of the power of sin over us. The child is raised to new life, a fresh start, free from the judgment and consequences of sins that she hasn't even committed yet. And then the Romans reading takes to thine own self be true head on when it says, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. Paul is saying that our compass in life shouldn't be on what we want, but on what Christ wants. The old self was just that, selfish. But Christ's death and resurrection free us from enslavement to selfishness. In other words, Christ can help us live beyond our own selfishness and into his self-giving love. Now let me say it again. To thine own self be true is fine so long as our personal principles are honorable, and so long as we consistently live by them. But who among us can say that we do that? I'm sure that we all know right from wrong and want to live good, righteous lives. But do any of us do that all the time? Of course not. Now, if, if any of you out there live perfectly honorable, lives all the time. Please raise your hand because I'd like to know how you do it. <laughs> now the fact is, as scripture reminds us, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all want to live right according to our principles of what is kind, life-giving, and true, but do we do that consistently? So it's not so much that to thine own self be true is bad advice as it is that it is advice that is pretty much impossible to actually live by. So what do we do about it? 
Do you ever find yourself kicking yourself for acting in a way that you regret? On a daily basis. I wake up every morning wishing today would be the day that I'd avoid judging others, that I'd be more gentle and patient, and that I'd think before I say some things. Wouldn't that be nice, Bruce, if I did that? <laughs> but then I get out of bed, and all that flies out the window. See, I know what my inner principles are. I know I want to do the right thing. But let's face it, as I said, it's hard. Even though I know that I've been baptized, given a fresh start, and that because of that I don't have to do the things that I know I shouldn't do, I do them anyway, right? Sound familiar? Yeah. Why is it that this fresh start that we've been given in baptism doesn't always seem to help us to be true to those guiding principles of doing the right thing? Well, Jesus has an answer to that. If any want to become my followers, he says, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Take up their cross? A cross is what it takes? But Jesus, you already carried that cross for me. Yes, he says, but because I was nailed to it, I've made your own cross bearable. The cross I died on makes your own cross life-giving. You see, the cross he's telling us to take up and follow him, it isn't a cross that we die on. We've already been crucified with Christ on his cross. No, the cross that we take up to follow him is more like a discipline for life. His teachings, training, trying and failing and getting up and trying again. Even Jesus fell a few times carrying his cross on the way to Golgotha. Crosses, they're big, heavy things. But our crosses are not his cross. His cross gave all of us life, a second chance, Forgiveness for the many, many times we will fall under our own crosses. And there is the important part. He says that we are to take up our cross daily. He knows that we will fail. He knows that we will fall. But each new day is a new chance to pick up that cross that he put on our shoulders. Each new day is another opportunity to learn from him, to grow, to serve, to get it right. And yes, to get it wrong, but to learn from it and pick up that cross again and again and again. And the more that we put that cross back on our shoulders, not just daily, but every time and every day that we let it slip and we fall under the weight of our own mistakes, every time that we put that cross back on our shoulders for him, we get closer to living by those wonderful inner principles that he put in all of our hearts. So perhaps the phrase really shouldn't be to thine own self be true. Because the real truth is that we cannot live by our best intentions. We get it wrong on a daily, if not hourly, basis. Which is why Jesus invites us to put that cross back on daily. Which is also why Martin Luther said that we should remember our baptism daily when we wash our faces. Because sometimes, sometimes we're going to get it right, but more often than not, we're going to miss the mark. But taking up the cross that Jesus gives us, learning from him, practicing our faith, even though we know we may never get it right this side of eternity, well, that is the whole point of life with Christ. For those whose guiding lights, whose application of to thine own self be true involves self-preservation at any cost, well, Jesus does have some harsh words. For those who save their life will lose it. And yes, unfortunately, the world has many folks in it who do just that, who have decided that getting ahead, no matter how they do it or who they hurt, is how they're going to live their lives. 
What does it profit them if they gain the whole world, but lose or forfeit themselves? Jesus asked them, although I doubt that such people ever bother to listen to him anyway. But I really don't think that there are many, if any, folks right here like that. Because if your true self believed that that level of selfishness was acceptable, well, you wouldn't be sitting here in church or listening to your devices at home. No. You are here because you do have honorable principles that you want to live by. You do want to be true to yourself because your personal principles include valuing and trying to live by the words of Jesus. But it's hard and frustrating because as good as our intentions are, we often do fail to live up to them. And I think where that leaves us is just this. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Jesus knows that this transformation he's making in us isn't a one and done deal. <laughs> you may have heard people say they've had a born again experience when they decided to give their life to Christ, but I often wonder what happens the next day. Well, the reality is that every day we draw breath we are invited to be born again in Christ. Every day, we are given another chance to learn how to follow him. Every day, we are given challenges to our faith that we may sometimes stumble over, but every day, we are also given the chance to let Christ help us up again. Every day, he fits that cross on our shoulders and says, follow me. Every day, he invites us to be true to ourselves, not the old self who died with him in our baptism, but the new self, the self that recognizes our human frailty, but that also stands firm and walks forward knowing that we are being given another chance to live by those lofty principles that are so beautiful but oh so hard to follow consistently. To thine own self be true depends on which self you're being true to. Is it the old self? The self that is selfish, fearful, and unfaithful? Or is it the new self that arose from the waters of baptism where God claimed you as a daughter or son and said, to this self be true? Because even though we know we're going to fail to be true to that new self time and again, that is the self that Christ died to see emerge in us, to grow in us, and to make this world the place that he created it to be. Amen. And our hymn of the day is a hymn that, I'll admit, is one of my favorites, but I think it speaks exactly to what we've been talking about today. It's hymn 798.